As you're being seated, let me take this opportunity to welcome you to Campbellsville Baptist Church. My name is Dwayne Norman. I'm the senior pastor here. We are so glad that you're here and already worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. It's good to see all of our members that are here and also those of you who are visiting with us who may be guests this morning. We're especially glad that you're with us as well. And we would love if you would do us the honor the bulletin that hopefully you received as you came in this morning, this worship guide's got a lot of great information in there. Love for you just to take a few minutes and look through the worship guide, the bulletin, and you'll see all the upcoming uh, activities and ministry opportunities that we hear that we have here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. But there's also a little piece that we would love for our guests. If you would take a few minutes, please fill this out, and you can leave it a little bit later in the offering plate or you can give it to uh, one of our greeters as we dismiss a little bit later this morning or one of us pastors. Again, thank you for being here. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord ready and willing to worship Jesus. We want to take this opportunity. Tomorrow is a very special day in our country. Tomorrow is Veterans Day and it's a day where we recognize and give thanks for the service and sacrifice of men and women who have served in the armed forces here in our country. And these men and women and their families have endured hardship and separation, sometimes loss, for the sake of keeping peace and 
fighting for justice around the world. And so what we want to do this morning at Campbellsville Baptist Church is we want to take a few minutes and just recognize and give thanks to all of our veterans. And so at this time, if you have served in some capacity in our armed forces, if you would, if you would just do us the honor and just stand, please. We want to take a minute, all of our men and women, please stand. Let's give these men and women a hand. Thank you. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray for these men and women, and also let's pray for our country. Let's just go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Father in heaven, we remember today with gratitude all those who have served in our nation's armed forces, and we recognize, Lord, that many, many sacrifices were made by them and made by their families. Lord, it's also a reminder for us to continue to pray for those who are currently serving in the armed forces. We pray, Lord, for divine protection for them. We pray for wisdom for our leaders here in the United States of America, our president and vice president and his cabinet. We pray for the day, Lord, where there will be peace on earth. And we know, God, that peace ultimately only comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, truly may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we offer this prayer in the name above all names, in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing even so come, Lord Jesus come. is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing even so come, Lord Jesus.
seated as our ushers come forward. I want to talk to you about an incredible opportunity that we have as Campbellsville Baptist Church. We have, in the last two weeks, ministered to over 2,000 people who came through our 
uh, gymnasium in Eats and Treats. And we shared the gospel, and we're going to do some follow-up work if you look in your bulletin on that. We have packed 1,098 boxes for Operation Christmas Child. And so Campbellsville Baptist Church has a heart and a passion for missions and outreach. You've, we've proved that over the 200 plus years of existence. We also have one more opportunity coming up very soon. And it's called Room at the Inn, where we have identified 23 families that have 63 children that without our help may not have Christmas. And so we need your help. We need you to give. There's an offering envelope that you may have received on the way in or just dedicate it uh, to help pay for the gifts for these children, 63 children. We're going to bring them into our church, the whole family, and feed them and give them gifts that they can pick for their children. We're going to wrap those gifts for them because we, and we need gift bags and we need bows and we need tissue paper and tape because that's an expense many people don't want to afford when it comes to Christmas because it's extra. Um, but we also will pray with them. We'll take them in a room and have a special prayer time with each family. The children will be somewhere else being taken care of and doing crafts and playing games and also they'll be fed. And so we want to make this experience incredibly great for them. But more importantly, we want to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. And the reason why we do everything is because of him. So I hope that you will be a part of that, whether through giving, through prayer, showing up on that date, you know, uh, December the 7th. It's on a Saturday morning. And there are some sign-up tables in the marble step area and then in the back foyer as you leave. You can get off the elevator and they'll be there. Of places you can sign up, of spots you can fill, because we need you. We also need one more host family. One family had a conflict of being able to host a, uh, one of these families. And so we need one more host family. If you'll see Peggy Richardson or Cindy Perkins or Rhonda Rose and Virginia Graves, and I'm missing somebody, but um, you've got the idea who you can contact or step out at one of the tables. Let's go ahead and pray for our offering. God, we thank you so much that, we're, that we have a passion to serve you as a church, as we want to reach out not just around the world is so important with boxes and sharing the gospel that way, where a thousand, almost 1,100 kids will get to hear the gospel, not just because of eats and treats and providing candy and follow-up and visits, but also by investing in the lives of families that are not just a one and done. They're, we've ministered to many of these families through the backpack program in the summer and now through this. And so God, help us to build relationships with this community. Give us the inspiration and the focus to love this community with our hands and our feet and our voices. And God, as we give, may this offering be multiplied. May it go and to serve greater purposes than we can ever imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh! 
Amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. John chapter 11, take your Bible, turn there. We're continuing our series on the I Am statements of Jesus from John's Gospel. John chapter 11, verses 17 through 27 be our text this morning. Is there anything worse than getting the news that someone that we love or know has passed away suddenly? We experience initial shock and grief as we begin to try to process that kind of news. Many of you are aware of our real estate agent back in Troy, uh, Mike Lott, who passed away about a month ago. He went in for, you know, to Birmingham, Alabama, to one of the major hospitals there, and but for relatively minor surgery and passed away during the the surgery, totally unexpected. I remember uh, being in, uh, drinking a cup of coffee as I received that news in just utter shock. Well, in John chapter 11, we witness Jesus deal with the death of his friend Lazarus. And what we will learn this morning is that death and the grave is no match for the power of the omnipotent one, Jesus Christ. This morning we will learn that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and all who believe in him will live eternally. Pray with me. Father, as we study your text as we study your word this morning together. Lord, what a blessing it is! It has already been to worship you corporately with our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Father, there's not a single one of us in this room that in some way has not been touched by the sting of death. But Lord, thank you for Jesus. That because of Christ, because of his death on the cross, and because of his glorious resurrection, he has removed the sting of death for all those who are in Christ Jesus. So Lord, let your word penetrate, speak to our hearts this morning. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 11, we want to share with you four observations from our text. Number one, notice that Lazarus' death led to painful lamentation without Christ. There was, there was mourning that took place. We're going to back up and just read beginning in verse 1 so that we kind of get the setting here. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, if we didn't know the rest of the story, that would not make any sense, would it? Why would Jesus prolong, why would Jesus delay coming to see and be with his friends and his family? We know the rest of the story, or at least we will know the rest of the story in a few minutes. Verse 7, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? They didn't understand. Jesus, why would you be going back into the lion's den, per se? Why would you be going back towards the ones, back to Jerusalem, back to the area of Judea, back to the ones who are trying to kill you and stone you to death? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world, of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And disciples didn't understand. They said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. In other words, it's good that he's sleeping. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Verse 17, our text this morning. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Lots of significant points that we want to share and a lot of background that we want to give as we study this text together. First, the significance of four days in the grave. The rabbinic belief was that the soul would hover over the, over the deceased person, the body, for first three days. But as soon as decomposition would begin to set in, the soul departed and death was irreversible. And so the point that... The writer here, John, is trying to get across is that Lazarus was, was dead, 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 if you know what I'm saying. He's, he's been dead for four days now, and it, was, it, was, it would take a miracle of epic proportions for Lazarus to be able to come back. Burial usually followed shortly after death, and John was getting the point across that Lazarus was really, really gone. Many had come to console Martha and Mary. We see that language in verse 19. Jesus himself came. We see that in verse 17. The Bible says that many Jews came, verse 19. 
The many Jews that came from Jerusalem would suggest that this family was rather prominent. This was a, this was a, a well-known, probably wealthy family, the family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This theory would be even further supported when you consider the expensive perfume that was poured on Jesus by Mary, John chapter 12. And when a person died in this Jewish context, the background here, the, the Jews would mourn for a prolonged period of time, upwards of 30 days. And furthermore, it would even be considered a pious duty to comfort the bereaved. Notice Mary and Martha's response to Lazarus' death in verse number 20. The Bible says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Mary remaining in the house would have been customary for those mourning for the loss of a loved one to be seated while being consoled by their friends. Martha, on the other hand, heard that Jesus was coming, and as really kind of part of who Martha is, she went immediately to Jesus when she heard that Jesus was coming. We've seen this side of Martha in other biblical texts. She was the one often to take the initiative. She was the one to go and and tell Jesus, what is Mary doing? Mary's just worshiping at your feet. I'm in the kitchen doing all the work. Martha was the one that often would take the initiative. And here she takes the initiative again and in going to Jesus and leaving those who were trying to comfort them. Luke's gospel tells us on, on one occasion, Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Martha was busy with her household duties. But don't miss Martha's word, words to Jesus in verses 21 and 22. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Some see this as almost, if you will, kind of a gentle rebuke, a, a mild rebuke from Martha towards Jesus, or even maybe a hint of disappointment that Jesus delayed. As I began to process that in my own life, I began to think, has there been times in my life where Jesus, I felt like Jesus didn't show up when Jesus was supposed to show up. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever asked in the midst of your pain, maybe you're even experiencing right now, why Lord? Where are you? Where were you? Why did you delay? Why are you delaying? Maybe you come from a past of abuse or neglect in your background or some other type of darkness that may be in your past and you can fully comprehend Martha's question. Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where were you? Her words mainly seem to reveal, though, a faith that believed Jesus could have kept her brother from dying. Notice what she said again. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So, even in the midst of Martha's pain and hurt and disappointment, there's a quiet, subtle trust in Christ. There's a trust in the Lord. She goes on to say, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, I'm not so sure that this statement shows that she believed at this point that Jesus would ra raise Lazarus from the dead. Why? Because of her statement in verse 39 seemed to show some unbelief. If you drop down to verse 39, I've got to turn a page over. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. It seems as if she didn't, she trusted that Jesus could do something, but she didn't fully, at this point, believe that Jesus would do what he ended up doing, and that's raising Lazarus. There's a quiet trust here, though. She does recognize a deep intimacy between he and his father, Jesus and the father. She trusted, <coughs> she trusted that his prayers could bring some good from this tragic situation. 
you do realize you've experienced the pain of death is great. Someone once pictured death as a, as a monster that's armed with a deadly sting, with a piercing, painful sting. Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 15. And at times, the sting of death can, can be overwhelming. It can be overbearing. But you realize death without Christ is another level of pain. This is what we see happening with this family. Lazarus' death led to painful lamentation without Christ. Secondly, Lazarus' death led to a promising conversation with Christ. Look at verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. His words there, Jesus' words could be taken to mean either your brother will rise again in the general resurrection on the last day. She, Martha, had an understanding of the Jewish belief of resurrection, or could be, it could have meant your brother will be restored to life immediately. But Jesus, Jesus here certainly meant the latter, but Martha didn't understand. Martha understood Jesus to mean that her brother will rise again in the general resurrection on the last day, and her understanding of end-time resurrection would certainly have been in concert with Pharisaic beliefs, not the Sadducees, who the Bible teaches did not believe in the resurrection, but certainly the Pharisaic belief, popular Jewish opinion, and even Jesus' teaching, she would have been right along with the idea of the resurrection. The Warren Wearsby said it this way, Martha was looking to the future. That's what she had in mind as she considered her brother's death knowing that Lazarus would rise again and she would see him. Her friends will eventually learn, if you continue to study there in John 11 all the way down to verse 37, her friends were looking to the past and they were asking questions like, he could have prevented Lazarus from dying if Jesus had just been here. Even Mary and Martha themselves would voice. They were not only looking towards the future, they were looking back towards the past if Jesus had just been here. But Jesus tried to center their attention on the present. Wherever he is, God's resurrection power is available right now. Was Martha aware of Jesus raising the widow's son and Jairus' daughter? If so, how did she not make the connection that the Lord could do it again and raise her brother? Even if she wasn't aware, she had seen Jesus perform other miracles. But the greater question today is this that we need to ask in our 21st century context. How can we be aware of the gospel accounts of all of Jesus' miracles, including his own resurrection, and yet doubt that he can perform miracles in our own life or even in our own church? Maybe they didn't have all of God's Word at this point. They didn't have all of the New Testament, but we do. As believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've we've got both Testaments. We're blessed to have the full account, the full revelation of God's Word. And it's a reminder this morning, church, that if Jesus has conquered death, and He has, then Christ, who is powerful enough to conquer death, can also... Save your one that is far from God. You say that would be a miracle. Well, that's good because Jesus is in the miracle-making business. Friend, if he's conquered death and Jesus has conquered death, then Christ can change the heart of your prodigal son or daughter that is far from the Lord. That, that you, you have little faith that will return to Jesus. If he can resurrect the dead, and he has, then Jesus can perform that miracle in your life as well. Friend, if he's conquered death, and Jesus has conquered death, then he can bring life 
to an unhealthy church. He, he can bring life to a dead church. Not only can He resurrect individuals, bringing them from death to life in Christ Jesus, He can resurrect a dead church. He can resurrect a dead group of people, an unhealthy group of people. Friend, if He's conquered death, and He has conquered death, then He can enable you to endure any kind of difficult season of life. He can empower you to get on the other side of whatever you're dealing with in your life right now. See, some people would say, well, that's great. The resurrection is wonderful. I see His power. But that's to come. That's in, that's in years to come whenever Jesus returns at the end of time. But what we need to realize is the same Jesus that arose from the dead and conquered death is the Jesus that is empowering and at work today. And so we need to be reminded of His resurrection power, of who He is and what He has done every single day of our lives, every single day as we work and minister through our local church. There's a promising conversation here with Christ. But thirdly, there's a powerful declaration. Don't miss this powerful declaration from Christ. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is the fifth of the seven I am statements in John's gospel. A couple of thoughts here. First, Jesus is once again, for the fifth time, making a direct claim to deity. The great I am would remind the Jews of Exodus chapter 3 and how God revealed himself in the burning bush as the great I am to Moses. So he is God in the flesh. This is another one of those declarations from Jesus himself that he is God. Second, Jesus would bring the doctrine of the resurrection out of the shadows and into the light. The Old Testament teaching about death and resurrection was not complete. It is, if you will, in the shadows. But by his teaching, by his miracles, and by his own resurrection, Jesus clearly taught the resurrection of the human body. Third, Jesus would transform the doctrine of resurrection this way. He took it out of just abstract belief of something that will happen years from now in the last day to put it into a person himself. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The SV Study Bible says, Jesus did not merely say that he will bring about the resurrection or that he will be the cause of the resurrection, both of which are true, but something much, much more stronger. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Future resurrection is only possible through Jesus Christ. No eternal life nor resurrection is available outside of Jesus Christ. And so the idea is this. Martha, as well as Lazarus, had no hope without Jesus. You and I have no hope outside of Jesus Christ. Folks, the fact of the matter is we can extend that. Our nation has no hope without Jesus Christ. And the nations, the ethne, all people groups, have no hope outside of the resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on to say, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Three quick thoughts. Number one, Jesus is bringing emphasis here to the spiritual nature of life in Him. The person who believes, though he die, he will live. How? Those who believe in Christ will be resurrected on the last day. Number two, not only is Jesus bringing spiritual, the spiritual nature of life in Him, He's bringing emphasis to the eternal nature of life in Him. Notice His language there, shall never die. Some translations pick up on the, the uh, double negative in the Greek there. Shall never ever die, some of your tr English translations will say. 
Literally, Jesus is saying, never, never die. Those who are in Christ will never, ever die. Eternal life is a present reality for all believers, not just some future event. Certainly it's in the future, but Jesus is saying it's right here and right now. When you come to Christ, eternal life begins at that point, not just when an individual dies one day. Not only is eternal life for the hereafter, Jesus is saying eternal life is for the right here and the right now. And then Jesus is bringing thirdly, he's bringing emphasis to the recipients of life in him. Did you notice the language? Who are the recipients? It only comes to those who believe in Jesus. By the way, that word believes there is present tense. It means continual action. So it implies those who continually place trust in Jesus. What about Kanye? That's the question, right, Scott? What about Kanye? Yes. If Kanye genuinely believes in Christ, he will live and never die. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not just Kanye, it's every person in this room, it's every person in the world. The Bible says there in verse 27, verse 26, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So the recipients would be anyone who places continual trust in Jesus he will live and never die. D.A. Carson summarizes John eleven twenty five twenty six 26 as follows. Ordinary mortal life ebbs away, but the life that Jesus gives never ends. It is in that sense that whoever lives and believes in Jesus will never die. And then the question. It's the question of the hour. Jesus asked Martha, what? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is not asking, Martha, do you believe that I'm about to raise your brother from the dead? That's not what he's asking. Instead, Martha, can you go beyond this subtle, quiet confidence that your brother, go beyond that, that your brother will be resurrected at the last day to personal trust in me as the resurrection and the life. Martha, I am the only one who can grant eternal life and the promise of transformation of resurrection. Martha, do you believe this? Jesus places the beautiful promise of new life before Martha, and he simply asks her this question. Do you believe this? I'm embodying it, standing before you, Jesus says. I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, do you continually believe this? Friends, many things could be said about Jesus, the cross and the resurrection. But the question this morning that Jesus places before us is this. Do you believe these words? Do you accept this to be true? Now, before you answer that question, let's see how Martha answered that question. Look at verse 27. And we will see that Lazarus' death led to a personal confession of Christ. Verse 27, she said to him, yes, Lord. That's a good answer to Jesus, isn't it? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. What is she saying? With the affirmative, she's saying, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe, Lord. Then she states literally, I have believed. It's perfect tense. In other words, I have believed it and I will continue. It's so, uh, something I have believed in the past and I will continue to believe it moving forward. That's literally what Martha's saying here. And will always believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. She called Jesus Lord. What does that mean? Jesus, you are owner of it all, you are master, you are Lord, you are rabbi. 
Have you ever come to the place in your life where you have said that He is your Lord? And not only do you say it, but you live as if He is. That He is Lord of your thoughts. That He is Lord of your life. He is Lord of your family. He is Lord of your church. He's Lord of your workplace. He's Lord at the schoolhouse. Your relationships with other students. Is He Lord in all of those places? He's not looking just to be Lord on Sunday morning at 10.30 and maybe Wednesday night at 6 and Sunday night at 6. He's not looking for us to compartmentalize our lives. I'm going to allow Jesus to be Lord of, of my life in this area, but all these other areas of my life, I'm going to keep those to myself. That's a lie from Satan if you take that bait. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Is he Lord of all your life? Martha's saying, Lord, you are Lord, you are Master. She called Jesus the Christ. What does that mean? You're the anointed one. You're the promised Messiah. She called Jesus the Son of God. The Son of Man was much more common uh, designation for Jesus in the Gospels. But here he call, she calls Jesus the Son of God. This refers to Jesus' divine descent. Also anticipates the purpose statement at the end of this Gospel. John 20, 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Here it comes, the Son of God. And that by believing, we've seen this kind of language in John's Gospel, you may have life in His name. That's the purpose statement for John's Gospel. And then she called Jesus the one who has come into the world from God. What does that mean? Well, this refers to this Jewish expectation, this fulfillment from all the way going back to Psalm 118, verse 26. Now, we would certainly say that Martha's affirmation, yes, Lord, I believe, and her personal confession of Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming in the world, are all great, right, and all commendable answers. And this would be a great spot to close the sermon. On a high note, if it were. But Martha's confession is not the end of the story. To get the full picture, we must compare her confession side by side with her reaction at the tomb. So go down to verse 38. And as Paul Harvey would say, let's get the rest of the story. Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, John again is trying to get that point across, right? Lazarus is dead. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, she uses that language again, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, in the most loving, gentle way, as only Jesus can do, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, come out. And the man who had died came out. John's making that point his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Martha was full of words, but she still missed Jesus' message to her. And this should remind us, church, and be a stark warning that we may be able to recite correct theological statements about Jesus, but actually fail to bring words and life together. Verbal confessions of Christ and life commitment to Christ are not always partnered with one another. In other words, sometimes we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. What have we learned from God's Word today? Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. 
and anyone who believes in him will live eternally. Now, do you believe this? Not anyone around you. Not the person who's not here. You're saying, man, I wish they were here to hear this. No. If you say you do, if you say you believe this, then you must know that we're talking about more than reciting more th- merely theological facts about Jesus. We're talking about future resurrection, but that's just part of it. He's talking about right now. The resurrection and life, Jesus Christ, the man who died on the cross and arose from the grave, wants to invade your present reality. That's what Jesus wants to do. Jesus is not content with any of us saying, I'm going to put Jesus in a box. And when I want a little bit of Jesus, I'm going to pull Jesus off the shelf. That's not the way it works with Jesus, church. That's not the way it works with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the resurrection and the life, wants to invade your present reality. And He wants to impact every relationship that you have at Taylor County High School, at Taylor County Middle School, at Taylor County Elementary School, at Taylor County Primary School, at Campbellsville, at KCA. Students, are you with me? He wants to pervade every relationship in your life. He wants to infiltrate your marriage and how you love your wife. He's not content with you saying, oh, pastor, I'm okay, my marriage is okay. No, Jesus wants to invade and infiltrate your marriage. And he doesn't just want to see a believer's marriage just coexist and survive. Jesus wants to see your marriage thrive and grow. He wants to influence, now I'm really about to start meddling, He wants to influence how you spend your money. He doesn't just own 10% of it, church. He owns all of it. Every dime in your bank account has Jesus stamped all over it. It's His. And He wants you to be a good steward. He wants to invade your present reality. See, some people say, Pastor, this is a message for lost people. It's a message for lost people, and it's a message for every saved person in this room. The resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ is not content just being placed over here. He wants to invade and infiltrate every area of your life. He wants to cleanse you from all your sinful stuff, from your past. He wants to redeem you. And he wants to adopt you as a child of his. He wants you to love him more and more. And not only does he want you to love him, but he wants you to love the community and the nation and the world in which he's placed you. He wants you to make disciples of all nations. The biggest lie in this room this morning that some of you are feasting on is that I can just come at 10.30 on Sunday morning and hopefully be out by 12 o'clock or even earlier would be nice. And I can live my life the rest of the week the way I want to live my life and do the things that I want to do and be the person that I want to be. And Jesus says, no, no, no. No, friend. I am the resurrection and the life. And when you are confronted with me, I want to invade your present reality. It's not just about one day. It is about one day. But it's also about right now. Right now. Would you stand with me? We're going to have musicians that are going to come and praise team members. We're just going to have a time where you can respond to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Jesus says, listen, I'm not not comfortable. It's not okay just to put me on a little box and pull me out when when it's convenient. That's That's not how it operates with the resurrection and the life. That's not how it works. 
the resurrection and the life stands before you. The one who has conquered death. The one who has arose from the grave. And He demands all of us total submission, total surrender to Him and Him alone. Father in heaven, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You, Lord, that As strong as these words are, Lord, I'm not even doing justice to how strong they are. Jesus is not saying, I am one of many, this is the resurrection and life. Jesus is not saying, I offer, merely offer resurrection in the end day and that's it. But Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And I want to invade your present reality. And I want to turn your world upside down. Lord, I pray for any person that's in this room, any youth, any student, any college student, any young man or young woman, or middle-aged man or woman, or senior adult man or woman, that would say, I've been placing Jesus in a little box and just pulling him out when it's convenient. And I rem- I've been confronted this morning with God and his holy word. And his Holy Spirit is bringing conviction to my heart that he is to be Lord of every square inch of my life. That goes for Sunday morning, that goes for Monday morning. That goes for Friday afternoon and everywhere in between. And so, Lord, if there's any person in this room that would say, I have never believed that Jesus, truly believed, I can cite theological facts, but my life doesn't back it up. If there's any person in this room, Lord, that that is them, I pray today, Lord, would be the day of salvation. I pray, Lord, today would be the day that they would believe And not only believe, but they would prove it by by their actions, by their fruit, how they live their life. The words that they say, the thoughts that come to their mind would be bathed in Jesus. Lord, not only do we pray this morning for those who need to come to know you, to believe in you, but Lord, we pray for believers in this room. We pray for believers Lord, who need to, need to be mindful that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And that begins at salvation. And it continues until that day that we stand before Him in glory. Lord, we need to be reminded of who we're serving and who has died on the cross for our sins. He is the resurrection and the life. So Lord, this is a message for all of us and I pray that Your Spirit would work in each and every heart. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we have some pastors. I'll be available as well. Maybe the Lord has just kind of spoken to your heart. You just need somebody to pray with you. We're going to sing. We invite you to come this morning. Speak to one of these pastors. Speak to me. Maybe you just want to come and pray for someone else. Or maybe just come and pray. We invite you to come to this altar this morning that we're going to make. You just come down. Speak to the Lord. Do business with Him this morning.
Amen. God is good. All the time. 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 Amen. In your bulletin, and Brad mentioned this a little bit earlier. uh, By the way, you can be seated just for one moment. I'm sorry. Uh, Will's about to come up. He's going to share a few words. But I want to ask you to do this. One week from today, next Sunday, November the 17th, I believe, 2 p.m., we're going to have an Eats and Treats follow-up. You guys did an awesome job volunteering, serving at Eats and Treats. As Brad mentioned, we probably had over 2,000 people from our community that came through, and we just sought to be a blessing to those individuals and a blessing to our community. Well, there were about 30 to 40 families that filled out a card, and in that card, they said, we do not have a church home. They marked that. We do not have a church home. Many of those 30 or 40 families also wrote down a prayer request. And so we want to go out next Sunday. We want to be a blessing to those families. And we want to say, you know what? We would love to be your church home. Campbellsville Baptist Church would love to love on you and minister to you and your family in the name of Jesus. So I want to invite you. I already shared this with the deacons this morning. But I want to open this up church-wide. Anybody that would like to come, we're just going to follow up with those families next Sunday afternoon, 2 o'clock. Uh, We would love for you to come and help us do that. It would be a great opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ and be the hands and feet of Jesus. All right, Will? Well, Pastor, as well, um, not only do we get to minister to them, but uh, they can be a blessing to us as well. And so it's just an awesome opportunity for us to do that. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of my my Auburn friends to come up, uh, Scott and Elizabeth. Um, and yes, I did use that in the same sentence, Auburn and friends. Um, 
I'm going to ask them to come up. Our family has had the privilege, um, all of our, our pastoral families have had the privilege of, of you all as a church praying over us. And uh, it has just been a blessing. I know I speak for not only for, for my family uh, directly, but also for, for each of our families, how we have had a privilege uh, to, to feel your prayers all week. And so um, today we are, we are going to pray over uh, Scott and Elizabeth and um, Eric Bruns, if you would come and uh, uh, take over. Uh, Eric is going to come and, and pray over them. And if you feel led and you want to come and, and lay hands on them, that would be wonderful. And then we'll turn it over to Eric. Caleb, come and stand with Scott and Elizabeth, please, as the treasured son-in-law in the crowd. Campbellsville Baptist Church, are we not blessed by our whole ministry staff? I have just been so overwhelmed in these last months for how the, the spirit, the power, the sweetness of what Jesus is doing here is continuing to grow. And I just thank you for each and every one that we've had the pleasure and the privilege of recognizing these past weeks. But join me as I pray for Scott and Elizabeth. Dear Lord, you open eternity to us by being the resurrection, the way and the life. Father, I thank you that there was a divine appointment years ago two brothers playing basketball in a driveway and a heavenly messenger came to share the word of the Lord and the truth of the gospel that lit a fire in both of those young men. And from that point forward, they have been kingdom warriors. I thank you, Father, that as a stone is dropped in a pond and rings ripple out from that, that what Scott has sought to do in his life has cast many rings in action in so many different ways. I thank you for the blessing of a godly and just awesome wife to be a partner with him in this gospel ministry. I thank you for their home that has raised godly children, each of them being ripples in and of themselves, uh, echoing out in our world. We thank you for being able to bless Caleb as a part of this family this morning that he too is now becoming a ripple in, in the Wigington Pond. Uh, but Father, I just thank you for his heart, Scott's heart for creating young pastors, young counselors that are also rippling out into the world. So Father, one day at a time, one soul care opportunity at a time. I thank you for his faithfulness and his joy and passion for the gospel, for exploring your creation, Lord, and just seeing you at work all around the world. Continue to pray a special hedge of protection around him, Lord, because as a gospel warrior, um, certainly Satan is not enjoying his work and just help them to be aware of the ways that the enemy would attack, the ways that the enemy would try to condemn and lie and accuse. Um, help them to be strong, Father. I thank you for the grace and mercy and forgiveness that is apparent in their lives. And I just thank you for uh, just the gift of brotherhood that I have had with him over these years and how iron sharpens iron, Lord. Father, go with us as we leave this place Thank you for this family called Campbellsville Baptist Church and how our shepherds are our friends and that we are doing gospel ministry together in all the ways that we can. It is in your powerful, sweet, and precious name that we pray. Amen. 